When Columbus landed on a tropical island in 1492, he thought he had landed in the Indies, these Indies, which as we all know, he didn't. By his death, Columbus never knew that he'd come across an entirely different landmass. He set forth to find a new route to Asia, he thought he did, and that was that. Despite being off by a few thousand miles, Columbus died thinking he was right. And it was all because of a weird geographic coincidence. So here's a really dumb, but in my opinion, interesting question. What if Columbus was right? Oh, oh god, is that what you thought I meant? Oh my, what a misunderstanding. You see, Columbus thought he had landed in the East Indies, but Columbus didn't actually know what the East Indies looked like, because the map Columbus was going off of looked like this. When I say what if Columbus was right, I'm saying what if the land masses of the world just sort of looked like that. First off, apologies on the bait and switch. I already know somebody on Twitter has already screenshotted this thumbnail without actually watching the video. You should have watched the actual video, you random Twitter user. You should feel foolish. This was the best way I could phrase a pretty strange idea and actually still get people to click on the video. If you already kind of know where I'm getting at, just skip to this time in the video because you already know what this is. It's another wacky geography video, you don't need the backstory. But if you're still confused about what this is, and why I'm talking about it, then you know, stick around, you might learn something. I've been fascinated lately about how people of the past viewed our world. And I don't simply mean whether it was flat or not. I mean how people before the Age of Discovery viewed the planet we live on. How they thought the world actually looked if you viewed it from the heavens, or space, or, you know, whatever. If there were ever expeditions into far-off lands, they were never revealed through maps, but instead through journals. Which brings us to Marco Polo. The writings of Marco Polo were influential for one key reason. They portrayed the Far East as a lucrative market with cities full of gold. Knowing Better has made a full video about what his writings specifically contained, but for the sake of this video, all you have to know is that these writings inspired this map, which then went on to inspire Columbus. And this map was not based on the most accurate descriptions, it was mainly based on hearsay. What I love about this is that right before the Age of Discovery, there was knowledge of the greater world, but a lot of their information was really fuzzy and off in a lot of strange ways. And this is best shown with the oldest surviving globe, the Erdifal. Created in 1492, I'd say it's pretty spot on for what people of Columbus's time thought the world looked like. This globe fully adapted the writings of Polo, flaws and all. Asia, for one, was thought to be a far larger continent than it actually was. Zanzibar and India were considered islands. Africa had this weird-ass coastline. And off the coast of China, or as Polo called it, Cathay, there were thousands of tiny islands. The most lucrative of them were to the south, and these were the East Indies. At the edge of these islands, the largest among them was Sapangu, or as we would call it, Japan. So that was why when Columbus first landed in the Americas, he immediately called these people Indios, or Indians, because he figured he had simply landed on one of the islands east of Sapangu. It's kind of tragically comical, isn't it? Like, thanks to a series of misinterpretation and hearsays, Columbus's voyage somehow ended up on some tropical islands exactly like he had expected. Imagine this from the perspective of the Taino natives, like a foreign force shows up entirely thinking they're in a place you've never heard of before. It just so happens that they're looking for a series of islands that coincidentally look exactly like your own. It'd be like if aliens showed up at Earth because they'd heard about a very similar blue planet, but it wasn't ours, and then they just conquer us anyway. There you go, that's the backstory. The gist of the scenario is that we're gonna take this inaccurate mess of a map, the best attempt Renaissance Europe had to offer, and imagine in a realistic light what this, uh, world could be like. 
This is absolutely the most Eurocentric scenario I've ever done. This is to imagine how differently other societies may have been if they had the geography that medieval Europe imagined that they did. Let's be honest here, this is just a fantasy map. Like Warhammer Fantasy. It even has Cathay. No matter what excuses I make, there is no possibility that the world ever could have looked like this. So get that out of your head right now. Much like that Continent of Moo video I did last year, I'm gonna try to rationalize another outdated abomination. So, the first question, to just get that out of the way right now, is what happened to the Americas? Do they just not exist? Perhaps, maybe parts of the Americas sank beneath the ocean, Zelandia style. So that was my initial explanation for what's going on here. But then I looked at Tuscanelli's map again. It clearly shows a distance between Europe and Asia that's only a tad bigger than the Atlantic. So that means Asia has to be bigger too. A lot bigger. I don't know if you knew this, but the Pacific is really big. This is 30% of the world's surface after all. What this means is that if Columbus was actually right, all of this would have been land. The ramifications of this would be horrific. Oceans regulate climate and temperature. They retain 83% of the world's carbon. Had this much land existed, it'd leave most of the planet an inhospitable wasteland. If there's a lesson to take away from any of this, it's that if the world truly looked like Columbus thought it did, then the Renaissance world he inhabited would have never existed. There's no logic to any of this. I'm making it up. I'm going off a cliff. Help me. When it was time to finally write this scenario, I kind of just stared at my computer screen. Geography dictates history in the grand scheme of things, and I don't mean that in a deterministic sense or as a school of thought. I mean, if Japan looked like this, then geography is certainly a factor here, because Japan just doesn't exist. How do you imagine different countries in an alternate timeline when the land is just so different? This almost becomes a philosophical question at a certain point, right? Does a civilization that resembles China even exist if the landmass looks like this? Do any of the countries and people around the globe still somehow resemble something we're familiar with? It really is an unanswerable question, because in real life, these cultures and people do exist, and the only situation where they wouldn't is when you're reimagining the continents for a stupid YouTube video like I'm doing. So, the way that this is going to work is that instead of imagining some singular alternate scenario for how I think things could have gone, I'm going to examine each region individually. And hey, if you have any ideas for what these regions could have looked like too, say it in the comments. During Columbus's time, there wasn't a great idea about what Northern Europe actually looked like. Scandia, or Scanza, was the name of the island that was figured to exist. I like the idea that this peninsula is one large island. Viking island, you could say. What's funny, actually, is that 10,000 years ago, the southern part of the peninsula actually was an island. The most specific thing I can tell you is that similar types of people may arise that are strange mirror world versions of the people we're familiar with. As an example, the existence of the Germanic people, along with the cold environment, poor soil, and wooded forests of Northern Europe, would still create a culture of boat-building proto-Nordic people who make their lives on the sea. The thing is, with this geography, the rivers and mountain ranges go in a way that they just didn't in our timeline. What I'm talking about is entirely new tribes, new cultures. There could be potentially destroyed and assimilated tribes and petty kingdoms entirely because a river goes a different way. If you've ever played EU4, then you know the type of butterfly effect that can happen if a very small proto-kingdom gets wiped off the map early on. In their day-to-day, -day, these people's lives would not be different from the Scandinavians of our own timeline. They would be Scandinavians. It's just how they divide themselves would be entirely different. The evolution of Old Norse creates alternate mirror descendants that resemble the Swedish, Norwegians, and Dane. They just aren't. 
you can translate this to the rest of the world too. Think of them as false versions in a way. These false Swedes may still unify their petty kingdoms. Perhaps they would expand across into Finnish territory. Would this Baltic Sea even really be considered a sea? It's more like a strait, but whatever. Because there's a shorter distance between the Scandinavian island and I guess a Finnish coastline, perhaps certain parts of Eurasia already have Nordic influence starting in the Iron Age. Maybe these settlements evolve into their own identities early on, creating a culture just like the Norwegians and Swedish did, ones that would continuously clash with the interior Finns. Perhaps some other culture arises on this larger island. I'm going to call it Baltia, based on the mythical island that the Romans believed actually existed here becoming a Viking outpost that can raid the coast of Eurasia, or use the rivers to go into the interior. I could imagine this region being like a northern Aegean Sea, just with a lot less people. A similar cultural group that are on two different land masses. As the Viking Age comes to an end and settled kingdoms arise, I could see a settlement taking advantage of this strait controlling the flow of goods and travel through the Baltic and North Seas. Maybe they'd become a rival of Copenhagen. Could an entity like the Kalmar Union last longer if this was an island and not a long peninsula? Would the Hanseatic League even still exist? I guess it's up to your faith in German economics. While Arabia is certainly interesting and is giving me a thumbs up, I'm going to skip over it. Perhaps these mountains here act as a buffer, and they could have slowed down the advancement of the Muslim Caliphate. At least that's what I originally wrote. These mountains, probably just put there for aesthetic purposes, were analyzed a lot by me. I pondered over if they could have been a southern wall for the Byzantines and Persians to keep the Arab invasion back. And then I remembered that the Arabs crossed the Zagros Mountains and took Iran anyway. If these mountains existed, Islam would have spread anyway. What a waste of time that was. Oh yeah, Africa. It's funny how on this globe it looks more like itself than Europe does, for the most part. Because we, you know, have this giant chunk right here. Marco Polo and cartographers of Columbus's time really overestimated the size for a lot of African islands like Madagascar and Zanzibar, resulting in, well, this. It's like a super swazi land. The northern coast of this peninsula could be a tropical forest, while the interior and southern coast could be a drier savanna and brushland. Madagascar is in a lot of ways a hodgepodge of animals and organisms that made their way from across the Indian Ocean and ended up on a single island. These wacky islands here are kind of just a continuation of that concept. Perhaps we may see a series of Madagascar-like islands with already unique fauna evolving into even more diverse groups. So maybe multiple species of elephant birds or lemurs. In our timeline, it's believed that Madagascar's original descendants came from the East Indies, as the shipbuilders made the journey across the Indian Ocean to settle the island. This is still mainly the case here. Some people from Southeast Asia may accidentally end up on the eastern part of this archipelago, if only because the ocean currents naturally travel towards Madagascar. There's always been this question about why Africans never settled Madagascar. The ocean currents go away from Madagascar and toward the continent, so good luck taking a boat there from the western side. With more islands existing, they break up the Indian Ocean current, so perhaps there's a slim possibility that with a weaker current, some of these islands are settled by Bantu Africans instead. There's a lot of possibilities that could happen with these islands, but for me, I'm going to act like the eastern islands are made up of mainly Austronesians, while African boat builders colonize the west. Local YouTuber tricks audience with intentionally inflammatory title. <laughs> How silly. Nothing can ever fool me like that. Oh no! My computer has a virus! I better click this giant button the website's saying has the solution. Oh no! The problem has been made infinitely worse! It's okay, Jimmy. I'm not a virus at all. 
I'm just a YouTuber, which is an entirely different disease. Luckily for you though, this was merely a test, and you failed. This video was sponsored by NordVPN. NordVPN shared lessons about cybersecurity with me, and in today's episode, I'm going to share some with you. So let's talk about ransomware. Don't you mean handsomeware? <laughs> no, never make that joke again. Say for some reason you're on a shady site, and it alerts you that you have a virus. Like any smart person, you of course know that viruses are bad, but what are you to do? Luckily, the website has a link to antivirus software, which will solve your issue entirely. Except plot twist, you never actually got a virus in the first place, but the website was able to trick you into downloading a file that in the end had a virus. Silly you, you've been bamboozled. But Cody, that seems like a pretty obvious trick that can be avoided. What do I look like? An idiot? Not you, Jimmy, but your grandmother is. Get it? Because old people get tricked by these scams all the time. That came out a little wrong, I should probably rephrase that. Since you can't always be there, NordVPN offers a level of protection for your entire family. And yes, even your technically challenged grandparents. That's right, NordVPN will stop your grandma from exploding. What if our grandma's already exploded? Well then you desperately need a VPN to save your other grandma. Take control of your internet experience today with NordVPN. Right now you can get a two-year plan at a huge discount, plus one additional month for free, when you go to nordvpn.com slash althist. It's risk-free with NordVPN's 30-day money-back guarantee. That's nordvpn.com slash althist, or click the link in the description below. Oh, Grandma, why did you have to pick up that dynamite? Oh, look, some dynamite! India is divided in half. For some reason, India was imagined to be an island, or perhaps Sri Lanka was mistaken to be a lot bigger than it actually is. Either way, this subcontinent, already sort of made up of divisions between north and south, now has those differences manifested into the geography itself. What a coincidence. So, in our timeline, North India is predominantly made up of Indo-Aryans, South India is predominantly made up of darker skinned people called Dravidians. Dravidians are a group like Slavs or Germans are a group. Because of this geographic division, migration into the subcontinent is entirely altered. With this strait, the Indo-Aryans kind of remain mainly on the continent. The Dravidians are a bit more complicated to figure out. You see, it's debated where the origins of the Dravidians actually are. They share a major mixture of native indigenous Indian DNA, but it's thought that they themselves could have migrated into the continent as well. Yes, I did say native indigenous Indians. In this alternate timeline, India as we know it is really split into two separate regions entirely. The admixture between these two groups doesn't really happen. Continental India is still settled by Hindu and other Indo-Aryan groups between the Himalayas and this strait, let's call it the Strait of Madhya, while the Dravidians' fate is somewhat unclear. It's possible they may have crossed the strait and settled most of the southern island, mixing or replacing the native population, but it's also possible that the Dravidians never cross into this island. It mainly remains controlled by the natives. Alright, I should probably clarify what that means. When humans left Africa thousands of years ago, the first place they went wasn't Europe or Central Asia. They followed what was familiar, the tropical coast of the Indian Ocean, settling and migrating over thousands of years until eventually they crossed into Sahul. Their descendants have kind of remained ever since then. This broad group contains Australian Aboriginals and Papua New Guineans. These are groups who were isolated by geography and were kind of spared from thousands of years of future migrations. Not just from Indo-Aryans, but people that originated in southern China. 
settling into Indochina and Indonesia. Small minority groups still survive today. There's a small chance that India's native groups remain bigger in this alternate timeline. The North would be prime real estate for any kingdom or empire, because this strait would be one of the most lucrative markets in the entire world. Think of it like an Indian version of the Strait of Malacca in Malaysia. This is almost a highway that cuts through India. I'd imagine its history is nothing but competing empires and kingdoms rising and falling just to get a slice of this trade market, creating coastal cities and magnificent monuments from a trade of spices and various other goods. This may be its own small Mediterranean, if the Mediterranean was more like a river that changed its course with the monsoon winds. At certain times of the year, some cities may be difficult to travel to as the current flows away from them. This may make the most prosperous cities the ones that sit directly in the middle. These regions always have some market. South India in our timeline was a part of the Indian Ocean trade, but with this natural strait, the southern coast is kind of bypassed. Merchants may go from Egypt to Arabia, through India, and then on to another India. Wait, what? What even is that peninsula? My best guess is that this is supposed to be Burma. This giant chunk is supposed to be Southeast Asia. This funhouse version of the world is proportioned so differently than what it is in reality that it fundamentally alters what this region even would be. In this alternate timeline, this super Southeast Asia is still warm and tropical. I need a name for this landmass. How about Sundaland? During the last ice age, water levels were so low, this entire archipelago and peninsula was an even bigger peninsula. Kind of like what's shown on the map. So, Sundaland is a fitting name. This super Southeast Asia, Sundaland, is still warm and tropical. It has a rainforest that runs through its center along the equatorial line. In fact, the climate is consistent throughout this peninsula. The globe shows no stark mountains that would interfere with wind patterns. The further south we go, the more temperate the environment gets. Sepangu was projected to be 20 degrees north, equivalent to Hawaii in our timeline. That's within the tropics, a region that the East Indies should be in. But following the logic of the map, the East Indies are much farther south. The Urtifol labels them near the Tropic of Capricorn. In our world, this would place these islands roughly around the same latitude as Brisbane. This island chain wouldn't be a unified tropical jungle, but a gradient, much like Australia. The northern islands would resemble the equatorial lands we're familiar with, but the southern islands would be much more like New Zealand. Most of these still have warm to mild environments, Australia isn't exactly the coldest place in the world. However, it's interesting to imagine the East Indies as an ever-changing band of temperate islands. Perhaps some have a more Mediterranean environment. Ironically, if this map was actually accurate, the East Indies would not be warm enough to produce the spices that made Columbus originally sail for them in the first place. So, who populates this landmass? With a landmass this big, I don't think the East Asian groups that migrated down would have fully settled this area. We're talking about alternate migration patterns here. This is entirely fictional, so anything I say is not right or wrong, it's just made up. You can divide this up however you want, it, it doesn't really matter. Perhaps groups like the Hmong, Thai, Austronesian, and Austroasiatic still exist, and they migrate down south, becoming the genesis for a whole alternate tree as new ethnic groups splinter off from them. These then go on to form their own empires and kingdoms. I guess starting off with Big Burma, there could be kingdoms that rival the size of France and Germany simply in the north. This peninsula sees an influence of Hindu-Buddhist culture. Maybe this bay has its own complex network of city-states. Perhaps it's warred over by rival kingdoms. So in our timeline, the Majapahit Empire had a culture that was this Hindu-Buddhist blend, thanks to its direct connection with India. It'd be neat to imagine that same thing kinda happening in Big Burma. Another factor as well is this large river that comes north near India and the Himalayas. Perhaps the northern part of this region has a lot of Nepalese and Tibetan influences too. 
While it's always possible that real-world cultures could always shape these regions, keep in mind that the most likely scenario is that in Big Burma and Sundaland, there are new, independent, unique civilizations entirely equivalent to India and China that we just can't possibly imagine. Ones that are descended from the very same people that left southern China. Maybe we see a group of craw Dai settle around this lake basin. Maybe Austro-Asiatic people create a series of kingdoms along the long coastline. Perhaps the western coast of this peninsula is a part of a major Burmese superstate. Vietnam might even get longer, who knows? In fact, let's talk about the river system in East Asia in general. In our timeline, the Chinese civilization rose around the Yellow River, and eventually depended on the Yangtze River too. It was these two rivers that allowed China to extend its influence so far into the mainland. These rivers still actually exist, or at least an equivalent of them does. These alternate rivers don't simply go west, they go west and south, all the way south, connecting and going through the center of Sundaland. If this was real, the Yellow River would be the largest river system in the world. This river, which was already crucial to China, becomes the center of commerce, warfare, and life for all of these alternate civilizations. The river allows for travel and trade across the continent, a highway north and south. While I keep saying China, whatever rises here isn't the China that we know. The greatest change to geography isn't just the land being shaped like this. It's the invention of this gigantic river system that links East Asia with the South. In our timeline, trade from China to India was made possible by crossing the Strait of Malacca. But this giant peninsula makes that simple journey far more difficult and taxing. These rivers, though, kind of act like the next best thing. Whoever holds them kind of controls the Indian Ocean trade. Instead of Indonesia, this peninsula is a place for spices. Perhaps this land is the one that Columbus would search for the most when he sets sail. Oh yeah, this video was about Columbus, wasn't it? It's been a long journey explaining all of this, and I know there were a lot of areas that I kind of missed. Like, what's going on up here? Rest assured, this is still Siberia. There aren't a lot of people here. I don't know, I like to imagine that this is a giant freshwater lake created by the melting glaciers from the last ice age. Anyway, Columbus. Had Columbus still somehow existed, he'd be setting sail for a vastly different world. Let's go back to the map that started it all. If we're taking this literally, then Sepangu is equivalent to the distance of southern Mexico. Now in our timeline, Columbus's men were on the verge of mutiny because of the long journey. The main thing that kept them calm was the idea that they were going to reach land soon. They kept seeing birds and other things that signified that they might be getting closer before they eventually reached the Caribbean. This distance is a lot greater than the Caribbean. It took Columbus 36 days to travel from the Canary Islands to the Caribbean. By eyeballing this map, I can tell you that this added distance is really nothing to sneeze at. We're looking at roughly another week of sailing. Taking into account the angry crew and no seabirds to give signs, this is not the best recipe for Columbus's voyage. In fact, it's very likely that Columbus's men mutiny or turn back before ever reaching Sepangu. Now that said, this wouldn't be their last voyage. You see, there's a secret island I haven't told you about. In Columbus's time, there wasn't simply geography that was wrong. There were entire islands that were just made up. One of these islands was Antilia. Antilia was an Iberian myth, an island that was believed to be somewhere in the Atlantic, home to seven cities founded by Visigothic bishops who fled the Muslim conquests. I'm not saying that in this alternate scenario, Columbus and his men land on an island where a bunch of crusading cities already exist. I'm saying that according to this map, there is a fairly large island about the size of Sardinia between Europe and Asia. Seems like a great rest stop to me. In this alternate timeline, even if Columbus turned around, he or his men would make note of this massive island. Perhaps they even leave a few men there to set up fortifications in anticipation of Columbus's second voyage. 
Imagine all the wondrous island fauna that exists here, separated from the rest of the world by millions of years, only to go extinct at the hands of 15th century Spaniards. Some unfortunate island bird keeps Columbus's men fed until the next ships arrive, and Columbus would return. His first voyage may have ended in failure, but he did find the island of Antilia, so some progress was made. On a second voyage, with more supplies and more men, Columbus arrives on Sapangu. He'd be expecting an island full of gold, and that's not what he would be met with. I don't even mean because it's Japan. This island has no relation to Japan at all. When it came to Scandia or India, you kind of imagine the same groups migrating into these lands. But Japan? Yeah, no. Who does Columbus actually meet when he reaches Asia? There's two real possibilities. For one, Polynesians. Some people very similar to the Polynesians might have eventually spread out across the Pacific anyway. In fact, it's even easier for them considering the layout of these islands. These are thousands of islands the size of Crete or larger that are relatively close to one another. It's possible that instead of being isolated from one another by thousands of miles, the Polynesians create a vast network of islands. Honestly, the political makeup of this region would be fascinating. These islands wouldn't be united, of course, so I could imagine alliances and rivalries dividing up this pretty unique chain. The large island of Sepangu may be seen as the main body of this cultural world. Perhaps it's much like New Zealand, and it's made up of competing tribes along the coasts. The second possibility is migration from China. Now, the current Japanese population migrated from Korea around 300 BC. That was a smaller distance compared to these alternate lands, but it's not impossible that the same journey could kind of happen. I'm a lot more doubtful about this happening, though. If there is colonization, it would be a lot later in Chinese history. Perhaps these are Chinese colonists that follow the monsoon winds. You know what? I like both ideas. This is a vast chain. Not one group could control all of it. For the sake of time, I'm going to imagine the makeup like this. Feel free to disagree wherever you want. In our timeline, when Columbus made contact with the natives, they were not immune to old world diseases and were depopulated. When future navigators and explorers visited Polynesian islands, they were also not immune to old world diseases. But here's the thing, these islands are so close together that I don't think that the people living here would be too isolated from old world diseases. The Polynesians in this alternate timeline may have a lot more experiences with these diseases, simply due to being closer. Columbus may come across a series of Polynesian tribal kingdoms, or a Chinese descended people divided into various states. What I'm getting at here is that if the world looked like Columbus thought it did, colonization might not have actually happened, at least the colonization that we know of. The Spanish couldn't simply waltz into these islands and brutally take them over. The only reason they were able to establish such an empire in the Americas was because they used local politics to their advantage and fought people who still used stone tools. In this situation, the Spanish would be making a longer journey to come across islands and lands that might be on their same technological level. Maybe Spanish forts might be established on Sepangu. Perhaps they take a few outer islands. Spain may set up a few colonies in these island chains, but only to have a bit in that spice trade. Perhaps they still use slave labor to profit from sugar. Maybe there's a goal of taking Sepangu because of the belief that it has gold. The answer is whether they can actually take it. There is no silver to sell to China, no tobacco to be farmed by slave labor. Columbus might end up just being known for showing that the journey could be done. His legacy is introducing Europe to the same market that they already knew existed, instead of creating their own. Does the crown see it as an important investment just like they saw the New World? It really depends. It's also possible that these islands are forever fought over between Europeans and the Chinese, neither really gaining an advantage. Perhaps they fortify Antilia if only to keep it from the Portuguese. It would be fought over more times than I could possibly tell you. This little island would be the linchpin of the Spanish Empire. 
It would be the source of so many alternate wars, the gold mine that everyone wished to have, the doorway to gain them access to Asia. This would be a small fortress in the middle of a blue sea. It'd be a fascinating culture if it actually did exist. Portugal may try to take the island a time or two, but they would always fail. They'd continue on with their trade outposts in Africa, perhaps eventually seizing more land in these islands if anything. In this world, the Indian Ocean trade truly is the center of wealth and power. Portugal might, in the end, have the best idea. Or maybe not, because these islands probably create some insane storms. Okay, bye. Oh look, some dynamite! 